everybody. I'm Mary McKee with Find My Path. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I can see more and more people coming through. So we're, we'll, we'll wait a minute or two and let everybody join. We always love to hear where everybody is joining from. So please put your name or put your location into the chat. Let us know how you're doing. What's the weather like? Where you are? Where are you joining us from? And throughout today's presentation, if you have any questions, please do put those into the chat as well. Towards the end of the presentation, we will take some time for a bit of a Q&A. So we'll be watching the chat um, for the next 40 minutes while our guest speaker is talking today. And we'll hopefully be able to cover most of your questions. Um, so it's lovely to have, we have Gina here from Lincolnshire and with a Hazy Sun. And we have Alan from, uh, I'm guessing Illinois uh, as well. So we have a, a wide range of where everybody is joining from. So thank you again for, for coming along uh, for this special presentation that we have today. So we have brought in a guest speaker today. Her name is Jill Rossini. And um, Jill has been teaching and, and, and participating in uh, social and family history since 1988. Um, I've been fortunate to speak to Jill before. So there is, um, I think it was last year, maybe two years ago, I don't know, uh, lockdown and COVID, who knows what time is anymore. I think it might have been about two years ago. We did a bit of a, a, a chat for LGBT History Month. Um, so do, uh, if you enjoyed today's presentation, do take a look at that. It's a very kind of, it is LGBT history, but a different kind of focus um, from our conversation a couple of years ago. But um, Jill is the author of not one, but three different books. One is Same Sex Love, 1700 to 1957, a history and a research guide, um, which is where I was introduced to Jill's work and um, why I have um, stalked her for the last few years and, and forced her to come and participate in Find My Past events. Um, but Jill has also written a history of women's lives, lives in Liverpool and a social history of adoption. Um, so you probably will uh, see and hear more from Jill on this platform in the future, because we know a lot of you out there do have questions, particularly around um, adoption. So that could be a future episode if you're interested. And if you are interested in that, please, again, add that into the comments and let us know of anything else you're interested in, um, any subjects that you'd like us to cover for um, your Find My Pass at home. So uh, today's presentation, my Jill is going to focus on LGBT history in Cheshire, and I'll not keep you waiting any longer. We'll bring Jill in, and hello. Hi there. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Hiya. So, Jill, again, thank you very much for uh, joining us today, and I'm just going to turn it over to you. I've um, added your presentation in, and Jill, take it away. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who's come along today. I really appreciate you giving up your time uh, uh, where everybody's busy in a busy life. And um, it's great that you're interested in the subjects of LGBTQ history and particularly in a slightly different slant to it. Uh, because what I'm going to talk about today um, is LGBTQ history and research, particularly uh, in what is still a relatively rural county uh, in England. Um, now, I, I don't want to obviously patronise anybody um, and sort of go into chapter and verse about where Cheshire is and what it's like, but just one or two notes about it uh, for those who might not be familiar with it, because it's one of those counties that you, you tend to sort of drive through or think that only footballers who play for Manchester United live in. Um, so we'll just say a little bit about it historically uh, and then why I think it's interesting from uh, a historical research point of view. So this is the uh, map of the historic county of Cheshire. Now, as you probably know, if you're family historians or historians generally, a uh, lot of the county boundaries changed in England and Wales in 1974. And um, this is the original pre-1974 historic boundary, which includes the Wirral, uh, which has the industrialised areas of Birkenhead and so forth in it. And it's actually very well placed uh, if you are a person living in a rural county who wants to move to uh, a more industrialised area because it's got Lancashire at the top of it there, it's got Derbyshire, which had coal mining and so forth there, it's got Staffordshire with the posteries there, uh, not so much uh, Shropshire and Wales 
at that time, because I'm going to be focusing mainly on the 19th century. Uh, and as you can see from the population figures here, it started off with relatively small numbers. It's not a very small county. So 125,000 people in 1801 is fairly modest and it virtually not quite tripled, but well on the way to by 1911. However, if you have a look at these three maps here, which are, um, if you like, a visual description of the population density of Cheshire and Lancashire <clears throat> over the same hundred years, you can see that Cheshire has remained relatively rural at the same time as Lancashire has blossomed into a highly industrialised county. So obviously here's Cheshire outlined in red and at the start of the 19th century the two counties are both relatively rural but with the beginnings of industrialisation building up uh, in the Manchester, what we might now call the Greater Manchester area and if you like the cotton manufacturing belt. As you go through the 19th century this is 1851 and this is population density per square mile by the way uh, you can start to see some very familiar black blobs appearing so here's Liverpool this is Birkenhead which is time is Cheshire uh, you've got Warrington here uh, you've got Stockport and you've got Manchester starting to develop here and by the time you get to 1911 Lancashire is streets ahead in terms of the population density um, so I think it's quite reasonable to suggest that all through the 19th century, and indeed uh, in large areas today, Cheshire is still really a pretty rural county. And one of the things that seems to be a given in, what should we say, more superficial LGBTQ histories uh, of Britain is that there was a mass exodus of queer people, whatever they wanted to identify as today. Uh, into urban areas uh, in order to have work, to create social networks, to find uh, um, romantic connections um, and to feel safe. And that is absolutely true. Uh, we know that because of the beginnings of, um, if you like, the, the gay communities in uh, Manchester, London, other big cities like Birmingham and so forth. Um, but it's not entirely true because there were an awful lot of people in rural areas in Britain and probably in countries elsewhere, who simply couldn't up sticks and move to urban areas uh, for whatever reason. And those are the people that I've been trying to chase down over the last couple of years, because I think there needs to be a little bit of um, evening out of the score. There were lots and lots of people who nowadays would identify as LGBTQ plus in some way or other, we don't know what because they're not here for us to ask, um, who stayed in rural areas and who ex had very similar experiences in terms of their life patterns to the people in urban areas. So that's what's particularly preoccupied me. I'm going to show you two or three examples today of how you can build a life story for a queer person in a rural area historically um, using the sorts of sources that we all use for family history anyway, but with some added nuances in terms of how you approach that research. So just very quickly to have a think about uh, the pros and cons of staying in a, a rural area as opposed to moving to a more urban setting. I mean, it goes to, it stands to reason that if you move to an urban area, you would think you would have better concealment, that you could uh, keep away from your family, they wouldn't know what you were doing, uh, that you could find work that suited you and that you could socialise however you wanted to. Um, that doesn't mean to say that if you stayed in a rural area, you couldn't also have some anonymity. If you're in a remote area, then obviously there's going to be more privacy for you. You've got not got neighbours uh, looking through their curtains at you every time you leave the door. Uh, you might also have a very close-knit family network. And, you know, we can't assume that all families in the 19th century and 20th centuries or before were all uh, enemies of queer people historically. That simply isn't the case. Some of them worried about them. They, they cared for them and they did try to protect them. Some of the individuals living in urban or rural areas 
could have been married. So that would anchor them in terms of family responsibilities. Or, or if they were rural based, then they might be working on the land. They might be tenant farmers or, or have artisan skills that they could sell in a rural area. And it would make sense to stay there. Um, so it's a much more mixed picture than you might actually think. Although it, you might think they will be exposed in a rural area, um, there was also an element of familiarity, of safety in numbers. You've got the backup of family and possibly friendship networks. And people did find partners and live lives with them in rural areas. So it doesn't necessarily mean to say that you had to go to an urban area in order to um, find a romantic association. This picture, by the way, uh, is of the famous drag ball in Manchester at the Temperance Hall in Hume in 1880. Uh, and it is a good example, actually, of um, how particularly gay men would travel in order to socialise temporarily in one urban area, but then would go back home afterwards. So although a lot of the men who were at the drag ball, and there were 40 odd of them, um, were from the greater Manchester area as we would know it now, um, going up as far as Bury, down into Stockport, that sort of thing. There were also quite a number of men from Staley Bridge, from an outlying area of Sheffield, from Oldham, uh, from Ashton under Line, uh, from Leeds as well. So if you were in a rural area like Cheshire and you were able to travel, um, then you could have access to the urban centres in Lancashire or Derbyshire or possibly even Yorkshire in order to go and socialise. You didn't have to move somewhere in order to do that. Um, so some people, you might say, could have had the best of both worlds. Now, I did say there were one or two nuances that you would have to think about if you're going to do some uh, queer research historically. Uh, and one is the sort of terminology that was used, particularly in newspapers. Um, and if you do like newspapers, then your favourite toy online should be the British Newspaper Archive, without a doubt. Um, but also uh, popular media at the time. And the 19th century uh, was the era of uh, the first mass publications of the Penny Dreadfuls and of um, broadsheets, that sort of thing. Uh, and with growing literacy, people were very influenced by what all these different popular media had to say. So these are just a few of the terms that you would have to use in order to research people in the newspapers of the day. Uh, you can't just look up a name like you could with uh, an ordinary individual who wasn't part of what we would now consider to be the queer community and hope to get a hit, let's say, if they'd been uh, stealing something. Um, there is an added layer of difficulty with people who identify as um, one of these terms, if you like. Um, so, for instance, um, not only might they be hidden behind these terms, but when they were apprehended for whatever reason, and this applies to some of the men at the drag ball in 1880, they would have used aliases. Um, they would also have lied about their address uh, and their uh, next of kin, if you like, that sort of thing. So you've not only got uh, unusual terminologies to describe queer people, but you've also got their own attempts to disguise themselves if they ended up in front of the magistrate's court. So at the end of the day, they would lie in order to protect themselves and also protect their jobs and their family. So that does add to the complications of researching people. And I think as well, you know, it's everybody is very familiar with how a conventional heteronormative family operates. Uh, people understand what sorts of resources those people would appear in. And we all know that people lied on the census return about their age and about their relationships with significant others, uh, about children that they'd taken in from friends or family, uh, all this sort of thing, you know, bigging up their occupations to make themselves look better than they were. You name it, they did it. Um, uh, and you can be pretty sure that you would understand the sorts of social networks that a conventional family would have. So there might be church, 
social clubs, uh, mechanics institutes like adult education facility, that sort of thing. That's not necessarily the social networks that a queer person would have sought out. So the context in which that queer person, if you like, operated and lived their life um, has this added layer of relatively covert or extremely covert in the case of men. Um, what should we say? Networking that wouldn't be there in a conventional family. And that is a lot more difficult to pin down. But you need to pin it down if you want to understand how that person lived. And that would that would mean extra research on top of the usual family history um, structure that you're trying to create in order to work out what their life was like. Literally, what was it like to live as a homosexual man uh, in 1900? How on earth would he find other men to associate with? You know, did he ever have a long term relationship? But where would he find them? He can't go down to the local Baptist church social club like his, his straight sister and find a friend. It wouldn't be like that. So you have to have a much broader sweep. You have to be much more intuitive about what's out there. And that's going to involve an element of wider local history research. And I would say, if you are looking for that sort of detail in terms of um, queer networks, then uh, your county archive would be a fantastic place to start because they've been really trying very hard to build up information that queer historians can use. And they nearly all have um, guidance sheets that you can download uh, in order to help you do that. So context is everything. I'm always saying this to my history students, but it's very, very important, particularly when you're doing queer history or, or really the history of anybody who has that otherness about them in terms of their life in the past. Um, just very, very quickly about this picture here, you will notice that it looks as though it is um, a young man and a young woman who have cross-dressed in each other's clothes. Um, this has been a particular interest of mine, this picture, for a while uh, since I found it on eBay. Uh, nobody had noticed that there was cross-dressing people in it. Um, and um, I'm still trying to get to the bottom of exactly what they were up to. I think it might be a brother and sister. They are a Chester family. Um, but as to whether there's any queerness involved other than the cross-dressing, I couldn't say. And that's one of the difficulties. You cannot take something like that at face value uh, and assume that there was some otherness in their lives beyond dressing up. Um, and where do you find that, that evidence? You may never find it. So first of our examples now, I'm rattling through this because I'm really excited to tell you about the different people that I've been following up. Um, and um, you can always go back to the recording as well if you wanted to look at things in more detail. Um, so the first of our famous Cheshire queer um, ancestors, if you like, and this is the Taxall Brides. Now Taxall was in Cheshire up to the 1930s, it's now in Derbyshire due to boundary changes. Um, and I think the first instance of the, the uh, parish registers being picked up on uh, by a research was in 1975, and that was somebody doing some work on population studies, believe it or not, from the parish register. And um, this is what she found. This is ostensibly two marriages, one in 1707 and one in 1708, between what looks on the surface like two lesbian couples. So the first one is with Hannah Wright and Anne Gaskell, both very, very common names in the area. Uh, and the second one is Anne, as it was spelled A-N-E, presumably Anne with a more conventional spelling today, Norton and Alice Pickford. Again, uh, well-populated names in the area. Um, and at the time, they were taken at face value and there was a lot of excitement about them and everybody thought they were what would be termed sapphic marriages. Um, and then questions started to be asked. First of all, with these names being very common, particularly Anne Gaskell and Alice, that sort of thing, it's extremely difficult to identify which of these Annes and which Alices uh, you can find elsewhere 
in the parish records. Incidentally, uh, where I've put uh, anything in bright blue, such as here, marriage register and so on, these are records that are found in the Cheshire collection uh, of the Find My Past website. Um, OK, that sounds like a bit of an adverb, but it's also to reinforce the fact that these records are out there for all to see. And, you know, there is not a, a register of queer people from history anywhere that you can go and look in. You've got to go and look for them in the usual sources. That is where you'll find them if you look carefully. Anyway, so these are on the Find My Past website. And by looking into the background of these people, if there are going to be questions about whether this is a lesbian marriage or not, you would need to have a look to see if there was any evidence that they'd uh, married men elsewhere. Did they leave wills? Uh, did they pay into the parish poor rates and so on? Unfortunately, the tax hall records are rather sparse, as sometimes happens. You know, they disappear or, or are, are lost or accidentally destroyed. Um, so it's very, very difficult to say whether or not these women were together, whether they resided together, whether they are actually both female, because there has been a debate over whether or not Hannah and also Anne it is a corruption of an Anglo-Saxon man's name, Hannah, which is H-A-N-A. -A. And I can't tell you the answer, because without knowing more about the background of these four individuals, I can't tell you if these are lesbian marriages or not. I have a theory, uh, well, there are two theories that I've come up with. Uh, one is that it could well have been a way of, in a very rural, and it still is, a very rural farming area, quite remote. Um, it's on the edge of the Peak District. Uh, whether or not this was some local way of reinforcing some economic or uh, practical collaboration or something like that between these two individuals. Um, whether they were romantically involved, I have no idea because they're not here for us to ask. Um, the other is, um, and this is possible in a very rural area, although why they want to put it in the marriage register, I don't know, is that they were being publicly humiliated, that they were being laughed at uh, for being um, some sort of couple or partnership, if you like. That is possible as well. But as I say, without that all important context, it's very difficult to say for sure. Um, so I am still bit by bit trying to work my way through the many family networks in this area. And these names run right down into the Presbury Parish, which was huge at the time and still is quite big, um, to try and untangle all these family connections and work out who is who uh, and actually build some sort of timeline for these four individuals. Um, if I ever do, I'll let you know. So this one is uh, down in Middlewich, uh, other end of the county in a way, diagonally. And um, it's again, a uh, marriage register for St Michael's uh, in central Middlewich. And it again looks like a marriage between two women. Um, now, bear in mind the date. So this is 1750. This is two individuals who are uh, in their 20s, roughly speaking, as far as we can tell. Uh, we've certainly got the baptism for Mariah. Uh, and just bear in mind when you look at these things, that in a marriage register at the time, the man's name usually came first. So um, as with the previous slide, the first name on the entry would be in the masculine position, if you like. Uh, I can't find um, a definite baptism for uh, the individual known as Sarah Richardson, but also commonly known as Peter, but it's quite possibly this one, uh, which was a child of Peter Richardson, also baptised locally in Malpass, uh, which is not far away. Um, Again, it's so tempting to say, yep, yeah, definitely lesbian marriage, without a doubt. Uh, here is, if you like, a masculine, feminine, lesbian relationship. And, um, you know, they were allowed to get married in the local church just because the vicar was being nice to them. Um, I don't know. 
And you've got to bear in mind as well, at the time, with uh, naming practices, it was not uncommon um, hundreds of years ago for names that we consider to be um, ostensibly male or female uh, to be used in a different way in the past. And it was also not known, unknown for the eldest child in a family to be named after the father, whether that child was male or female. So uh, it's a bit confusing because you've got two names there. You've got Sarah and you've got Peter. I'm very tempted to think this is more likely to be a same-sex couple than the Texel brides, simply because there's a little bit more evidence as to the background of those people. But again, Sproston is a very common name in the area. There's a lot of Marias and Marys uh, with the surname Sproston around that time in the area. Sproston is a, a hamlet locally. Um, so again, more contextual work needs to be done to iron out what happened to these individuals. But it's more promising than some. So obviously can't ignore the guys. Um, so we're on to slightly um, safer territory with this because uh, these are men who contravened the law. Now, this is not the law that um, did for Oscar Wilde. That came much later in the 19th century. Uh, this was the law against sodomy. Um, and it's been standing since the 16th century. Um, and this was what these particular men were arrested as a result of. And this was um, up the top of the county, Warrington, which is uh, a large town now. I'm not even sure it isn't applying for city status now and again. Um, and was relatively um, up and coming um, semi rural community in 1806. Um, so a little bit bigger than some of the other Cheshire towns. And a group of men, if you like, a cartel of men. Uh, club together to purchase or to buy the lease on a house uh, which they used at the weekends for socialising uh, and one of the oldest uh, individuals in this social group was used as caretaker for the building and it was seen that he was used to open it up at the weekends keep it clean and presumably keep a watch out for any um, overlookers and that sort of thing and a lot of what we know about this comes from two sources. One is the newspapers. So the Chester, Chester Courant had a marvellous, um, uh, very detailed description of what was going on uh, in Warrington's first gay club, as I like to call it, just because it amuses me. Um, and <laughs> it's not very flattering either, because this is one of their best quotes. The horrid crime of sodomy, nearly sufficient to freeze the blood of a human being. Horrid crime being one of the things that they often used for um, events like this. Um, and these are men that came from quite a wide area, actually. As to whether they resided in Warrington, it's difficult to sell at such an early date because we haven't got things like the census. Uh, but George Ellis, uh, who you can see there is 50 at the time of his arrest. Um, he uh, was one of the ones that was acquitted in the end and he actually died in Liverpool. Now he could have run away there. It could have been where he lived anyway. Uh, Thomas Ricks. Ricks is his Norfolk surname, very strongly so. So it could well be he'd moved to Warrington for work or was uh, itinerant. No idea again, difficult to say. Um, another man was from Winnick, which is um, a rural area not far from Warrington and so on. Um, so these men, I think, are probably a mixture of residents of the area and people who came in to socialise. Uh, and although, you know, I'm making light of the fact that it's Warrington's uh, first gay club, uh, it all ended horribly for a few of them. Now, in terms of newspapers, these are absolutely marvellous for background and context, particularly where other records have been lost or destroyed as a matter of policy or accidents. Um, and I would just like to say in defence of historic newspapers, obviously, any popular media has to be taken with a pinch of salt, but they're a marvellous starting point for research. And then it's up to you as a historian of queer or anybody else uh, to go and see if you can verify what it's saying. And um, you get used to the patterns of how they report um, incidents with 
queer people because they do tend to use the same sort of terminology uh, and respond to things in the same way. And I would say this, that particularly with certain groups of uh, queer individuals, they are not always condemnatory. So um, we can't, uh, you know, with the same paintbrush, uh, cover every newspaper as being um, horrified and disgusted by what's happened. So you can find names, um, not addresses necessarily, but locations. You find out how old people were. Bearing in mind in 1806, most people guessed at their age anyway. Um, uh, you can find out what charges were against people, uh, what their economic and social status was through uh, the stated occupations. Uh, you're looking at a social network here uh, and also the contemporary attitudes. And unfortunately, when it comes to men, the sentencing, um, because sodomy was a capital offence at the time. Uh, now, this is a, one of the Lancashire Assizes a sentencing books because they were sent up to Lancaster for their trials. And uh, there was a lot of argy-bargy, as there often is, before enduring trials. And a number of the men, because they, as it was said, admitted evidence, in other words, uh, if you like, turned king's evidence <coughs> and dobbed in other men, then um, they were acquitted or their sentence was reduced from hanging to uh, the pillory and hard labour and that sort of thing. Um, but out of all these men, we know for certain that a number of them were convicted of sodomy, uh, were sentenced to death and were hanged. So that included Isaac Hitchin, Samuel Stockton, uh, John Powell and Thomas Ricks, who's the one with the Norfolk surname. So, um, you know, we're, we're not looking at, um, as is commonly used in sorts of pride speak, uh, unicorns and glitter when you're looking at events in um, our queer history. Sometimes it can be very distressing <coughs> and particularly with things like even things that are non-capital punishments like the pillories they were a horrible thing for someone to experience because nobody stopped the public gathering and throwing heavy things like stones or pieces of metal at the people who were in the pillories and very serious injuries could occur So this is an individual that I'm particularly interested in at the moment, uh, and I've spent many a happy hour chasing them across uh, the, the wilds of Cheshire, trying to work out exactly what was going on with their life. <coughs> and this is an individual uh, who went by the name of John Smith, uh, but who was revealed uh, at the end of their life when they died, um, it was thought of dysentery, as somebody called Sophia Locke. Um, it would seem that they were born in about 1797 and they died in Macclesfield, which is a very famous silk manufacturing town in um, East Cheshire in 1848. And this is a wonderful example of how you can build a queer history or a queer biography, if you like, of an individual from major historical resources. It's not rocket science. You've just got to be diligent. And a lot of what you're looking at here uh, is from the newspapers. And stories like this were syndicated all around what is now the UK. And, um, you know, sometimes you have to go through every single example of the syndicated story because some had bits in that others didn't. Um, so it's quite laborious, uh, but it's worth doing in the end. So what the paper tells us, and this was, I think, the one I've quoted here, the Chester Corans, uh, Chester Chronicle, sorry. Um, <clears throat> is that uh, they were born in a uh, cave uh, near Croker Wood, uh, which is in Sutton, which is just south of Macclesfield. Uh, and they were an itinerant family because uh, the father of the family was a scissor and knife grinder. And this is um, an, a woodcut of the sort of thing that they would have done. So they would actually travel around um, offering to shop people's knives and their farm implements and that sort of thing. And it seems they had connections with the traveller families who used to overwinter on Biddulph Moor, which is down on the other side of Cheshire, on the Staffordshire-Cheshire border. Um, and uh, the family were well known down there. And in particular, 
uh, the person that became known as John Smith, was also well known as they often returned there during the winter months. Uh, and, and in fact, according to the newspapers, had started dressing as male at the age of about three. Um, so uh, John Smith, as I'm now refer to this person, uh, grew up and started to ply the same trade as their father and therefore also was very itinerant by nature. Now, if you think about uh, what a lot of queer people did um, historically, moving around, changing their address a lot, changing the name a lot, having lots of aliases, um, for safety as much as anything else, for concealment, then this was the perfect cover for somebody like John. Um, John had numerous female partners. Uh, one of the first was in 1823, when an affluent local man in Derbyshire um, asked them to marry a woman that they'd made pregnant. Uh, and the child was born and they stayed together for about seven years, uh, which is the, the age at which a child could become a pauper apprentice, um, paid for by the parish. Uh, and any maintenance stopped then and the couple split um, and they went their separate ways. Um, and then uh, John subsequently had a number of female partners, uh, possibly as many as half a dozen. And in 1834, uh, met a woman who had uh, 11 children and uh, stayed with that person very happily, it would seem, uh, until uh, the end of their life. And um, they travelled all over the place going hot picking in Worcestershire, which I've just found out is a thing I didn't know until I started looking into John. Um, and um, everything seemed to be absolutely fine. Uh, and this is the sort of person that would have been known historically as a female husband. So this is a natal female that um, passed as male in every way, uh, even to the extent of having wives and female partners. Some of them used to get married uh, in parish churches because they passed so well as male. And um, uh, most of the time, although one or two people might think, well, it's a bit of an odd chap, not very tall, hasn't got much of a beard, that sort of thing. Um, most of them managed to pass perfectly well until they died. And that's what happened to John Smith. Oh, just as a quick aside, I've been very busy, um, as I say, chasing John across the uh, countryside. Um, so I'm just gonna give you an idea of sorts of places that apparently uh, they frequented. So here's Macclesfield, here's Sutton where uh, the family apparently were when John was born. Um, New Mills up here is where John met uh, their final partner. Um, and you've also got Bidolf down here. Um, you've got Bosley, which is not far from Macclesfield. Um, so they're all of an area. It's a sort of a, almost like a circuit. And the good thing about it was that because of the sort of work that John did, if you started to feel threatened, if you thought someone was going to expose your identity, then you could just move on. And apparently one of the things that John used to say to people all the time was, please keep my secrets. Please don't tell anybody. So there was a fear there. Whether that would have been uh, expedited if uh, they'd moved to uh, an urban area, I don't know. But this is what John knew. This was their rural life. This was their patch. And so there must have been an element of safety there for them to stay in the area. Now, when John died, they were in Macclesfield and Macclesfield by then was already a sizable town for the times. Um, so there would have been uh, an element of anonymity uh, in staying there. And I think it was the second time at least uh, that, um, that John and their partner had actually lived there or certainly visited because it's not far from where they were born. And this is the street that John died in. Um, now, this to me, having looked at the background to the street and where it is, is a closely packed, um, high occupancy, um, if you like, um, middle of town area. It's now underneath the Victoria Shopping Centre, if anybody knows, Macclesfield. Um, and it reminds me a little bit of 
what they call the rookeries in Manchester, areas where famous female husbands like Harry Stokes um, didn't hide away so much as just were in hidden in plain sight. Um, so that we're in an area where you're not going to get dobbed in because other people have got secrets there as well. There might be petty thieves, there might be people who have been in trouble with the law. So, you know, it was a case of, I won't say anything about you if you don't say anything about me. Um, and it was actually the medical officer who first flagged up um, questions about John's um, uh, gender identity. Um, and you can see a very, very familiar headline here, uh, singular case of concealment of sex. Quite often, if you Google that sort of headline, then um, you will find something about a female husband. Um, and uh, he started probing and asking questions. And of course, having been to examine John, who by this time was very ill uh, and confined to bed in their lodgings in Derby Street, um, then he continued to ask questions, obviously, after John had died, because he is the responsible medical officer. Uh, and that's how the story really broke. He must have um, obviously told somebody at the time, word got out, it's a small town, um, and, you know, gossip uh, was rife. And uh, when the death was registered, it had to be registered in um, her, at the time, birth name. So this is John's death certificate, which I think is quite sad, really, uh, that somebody who'd spent all their life literally 45 years of it, passing as male, uh, was not allowed to have that dignity in death. But having said that, that is the law. So, um, you know, there's not a lot really could be done about it at the time. And they certainly wouldn't have had any respect for anybody's alternative identifications in those days. It was just accepted that this was somebody who needed a man's wage and therefore dressed as a man in order to get it. Uh, the fact that nearly all female husbands had um, one or more female partners or wives doesn't seem to have entered their heads. So this is the burial register. Um, and um, this is the church still in Macclesfield, right in the centre of town, um, at which John is buried, uh, unfortunately, in unmarked grave. And I have to say, there was no um, kickback, as I can see, against John's uh, partner. Um, there was no, who was quite open in saying that uh, she knew all about uh, John's um, birth identity. Um, there was a lot of people at the funeral, but there was no jeering or trouble. It was just a curiosity thing. And I find female husbands myself, although I've read alternative accounts, are relatively well treated for the times as, um, examples of otherness um, and I've never seen any real nastiness or anything like that in the uh, newspaper accounts of any of them that I've researched. So staying in Macclesfield, a rather more famous individual now and um, this is Marion Brocklehurst who was the daughter of an extremely wealthy uh, silk manufacturer and merchant uh, in Macclesfield. She grew up uh, wanting for nothing. Um, so she's a very, very different individual in terms of her um, life chances, in terms of her biography to John Smith, who we've just looked at. Um, so we're going to have a look now at the sort of records that we can find for somebody in the latter half of the 19th century, and also somebody who left more of a mark simply because of the position in life that they had. So she had um, a lifelong, well, what would you call her? Partner, wife, lover, companion, uh, friend, which is just unbelievably irritating. And people do still say things like that to you today. Um, uh, called Mary Booth, who came from an affluent military family uh, up in North Yorkshire, and who seems to have been friends with the family generally, the Brocklehurst family. Uh, and they must have met, I think, in the 1860s uh, and stayed together until uh, Marion Brocklehurst died uh, in 1898. Um, and there was never any shortage of money. Uh, so this was a family with status. Uh, and I would dare say that the Brocklehurst still have 
status in the Macclesfield area and in northeast Cheshire um, and um, are a respected family. And it was exactly the same when she was alive. Um, so here she is living openly with another woman uh, in a house called Bagstones. Uh, here's the uh, start of the census returns, which we will just run through because they're quite openly together on all the ones uh, that are there once they'd met. Um, and uh, this is the first one where we actually see them on a census together taking the waters in Great Malvern because they travelled an awful lot up and down. They had a house in Connaught Square in London, uh, which is still there today. It's number 27 if you wanted to go on a pilgrimage. And um, uh, particularly uh, spent a lot of time in Egypt because they were both uh, very, very passionate amateur Egyptologists and their collection of artefacts can still be seen in um, the museum that Marianne and her brother uh, funded for Macclesfield. It's called West Park Museum. And it's um, pretty much one of the pride and joy um, venues for Macclesfield. But this is an affluent woman, a hugely respected family. Um, uh, and yet she felt no need to um, decamp to Italy or, or to London or anywhere else in order to live openly with her life partner. She stayed very, very close to Maxfield all the time. She and Mary used to go and um, uh, stand in the middle of Macclesfield uh, in, a, in an area called Park Green and give speeches about uh, uh, anti-vivisectionism because they were passionate animal lovers. Um, they were very involved in the local community. There was never any attempt to hide their relationship. Now, you could say that that was... Uh, because Maxfield just didn't care. It might be because the Brocklehurst was such a powerful family locally that nobody was allowed to care. Um, it's presumably the family were okay with it because certainly they kept in touch with Mary Booth long after Marianne died uh, and also attended her funeral. Um, so it's a very, very different scenario to somebody like John Smith, who spent all their time saying to people, please keep my secrets. There was no secrets with Marianne and Mary. One little niggle that I've got is that on the 1881 census um, at their house, which was called Bagstones, which is in Winkle, which is in the hills, uh, not far from Macclesfield, where they had a, a small farm, um, and this was their home base, is that Mary is described as a companion to Marianne Brocklehurst, who is the head of the household. Now, they could have decided that that was what they were going to do. However, just bear in mind that the enumerator wrote out this copy of what they'd filled in on a form. It's more than possible that he decided that companion was a more appropriate term to use for Mary's position in the household than anything that they may have written down. For all we know, Marianne could have written down wife for Mary, but because those records don't exist anymore, all the original forms up to 1911 were destroyed. Um, we can't say. Um, but it just seemed to jar with me that people who'd lived together so openly and devotedly, who'd literally done everything together for decades, would describe one of them as a companion. That doesn't sit right. Uh, but I can't prove that there's anything different about it. Uh, we haven't got them on the 1891 census uh, because they were in Egypt. So obviously they weren't enumerated. Um, and um, uh, this is uh, Mary on her own at Bagstones in 1901. Uh, and she stayed there uh, until 1912 when she died. Uh, the very, very affectionate obituary for her in the local newspaper. A really lovely one. Um, and that's how we know that the Brocklehurst was still very involved in her life because they, the heads of the family were at her funeral. And this is the joint grave of the two women. Absolutely no concealments whatsoever. Um, and um, if we move on a bit, uh, just going back to Marianne's decease, uh, tragically, she committed suicide when she was at their London home in 1898. Uh, she hanged herself. 
and it's extremely difficult to find out anything about um, the end of her life. Um, and I haven't been able to get to the bottom of why. There are no obituaries for Marianne anywhere that I've seen in the newspaper. So if you want to have a go at looking for one, please let me know if you find it, because I'm really struggling. And I think it's got nothing to do with the fact that she was clearly lesbian. I don't think that was a cause for uh, shame uh, within the family or anything. I think the shame was the suicide, the unsound mind, the fact that she'd actually, uh, for whatever reason, it says melancholy here, the very fact that she was in that state of mind in order to do that to herself, I think that was the embarrassment to the family, not the fact that she was gay. Jill, I wanted to um, just jump in here. And yeah. so um, Victoria has added there to just say what a sad ending to a love to a love story. But yeah, um, I want to yeah, I want to call out to our community here and say, hey, if you can if you can help, um, do dig around and see if you can find out anything more about Marion uh, Brocklehurst and what we can what we can collectively discover. Um, if we can all you know work towards that and see if we can find that obituary, but. I think overall, I, I have to say, Jill, it's been a fantastic presentation. Um, Thank you. I, I think one of, one of the key things that has jumped out to me, I thought was really interesting. And you said this at the beginning and, and kind of halfway through about as much as, you know, LGBT people in history have, you know, struggled because of legislation against them um, or, you know, social persecution. But that wasn't always the case. Some, you know, some couples were you know, welcomed into communities, were a part of communities, and particularly when yeah. you talk about the female husbands, you know, and you read newspaper reports or even court reports about those kind of um, living situations that they're not really derogatory most of the time. It's just very matter of fact and more of a curiosity than anything. Yeah. Um, but it's it's nice to hear that side of the story sometimes too, that it's um, it wasn't generally always persecution. Absolutely. I think you've got to, you know, I, I hate the idea of um, victimhood in queer history. Uh, to me, yes, obviously, uh, such as the men who were hanged uh, in Lancaster, um, they are victims without a doubt. But you can't label everybody in that way. And I think that is, to, in a sense, demeaning to the people who were people like mm -hmm. John Smith and, and uh, Marianne and Mary, who were basically in their own way out and proud and living their lives actually as they wanted to. Yes. And during your presentation, we've had a few um, questions come in. Now, um, cool. I have to say I'm at a bit of an advantage because I got to read them about 15, 20 minutes ago and put some good answers together, but um, we'd love to hear your, your thoughts as well. Um, so Victoria asked, where can we find information on an official name change between the 70s and the 90s? Um, so Victoria knows the, the maiden name and the married one, but the deceased ancestor then had a different name when she lived as a woman. Also, um, and then another follow-up question then is how can we find divorce records for this period from the 70s to the 90s? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that if there's a name change, it's an official name change, then there does have to be a public announcement for it, which usually turns up in the Gazette. So like the London Gazette, yeah. depending on where you are, London Gazette, Edinburgh Gazette. Um, so we, on Fire Pass, we do have the London Gazette from 1665 to 2018 available. Um, but after that, your secondary source would be um, to go directly to the National Archives, I think. Yeah. And they would have records of it. Now, this is only if there's an official name change, which is mm. possible if you found the name after they the deceased and it maybe turned up on a, an official record. Yeah, so we're talking about the 19th century now, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I mean, even today, you can call yourself anything you want. Uh, there is absolutely nothing to stop you referring to yourself as John Smith the rest of your life, even if you were born as, I don't know, Mary Brown or whatever it is. Um, so long as you don't try and do that with Inland Revenue and the NHS, uh, in which case you've got to, or you want a passport. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right in terms of the deed polls. Uh, there are two levels of deed poll uh, change of, of name. Um, one is, uh, and I can't think of the date when the deed polls actually started, whether they were around in the 1870s, but um, you can um, have 
uh, your name officially changed um, by deed poll. But if you want to have that then registered um, on the national database, if you like, a national list uh, of name changes, then that costs extra. Um, so even then, sometimes it's not obvious. And, and the, the ones that didn't pay for the extra wouldn't be announced, I don't think, in the Gazette. Uh, although I stand to be corrected on that. But the difficulty with the Victorians is, you know, you'd only have to move from one... Oh, sorry, Jill. I'm going to jump in here. I was wrong. Sorry, you said, is it the 19th century? And yeah. I that wrong. It's the 20th century. Actually, oh, well. she's asking for... <laughs> Victoria's yeah. asking for the 1970s. Right, um, okay, right. I think, yeah, in terms of the deed poll, though, I think you're right. I think it started um, around 1851. Right, okay. I'm... According to the National Archives site, so I'm going to send this link onto the chat as well. The National Archives has a great research guide for changes of names as mm. well. Yeah, and it's a lot stricter, obviously, nowadays. Uh, but as I say, you can still call yourself anything you want. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, it's not necessarily something that would have to be published either, because you can do what's known as a statutory declaration, uh, which takes about 10 minutes in a solicitor's office costs somewhere between one and 200 pound. Um, and you literally come out with a piece of paper on which you have declared uh, under oath to change your name to whatever. And you come out with half a dozen certified copies of that, which you then send to the bank, to the passport office, uh, to your employer and so on. And that has no central database and is not published anywhere. Hmm. Right. Well, that's very interesting. And I know that because I've well, done it. And frustrating at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, it'll be frustrating for 100 years from now. for the Sunday Yeah. Sunday. Well, we don't care about that. So they can worry about that. <laughs> um, the, another another question that came through was from Amy um, asking, does this research, does this live stream apply to um, the United States? So I'd be one. I would wonder, Jill, do you have um, much experience in looking up kind of a queer history in the U.S. or following any cases over to the U.S.? I don't really know. Um, I've uh, read that wonderful book on female husbands, which covers um, cases mm -hmm. in both Britain and uh, America, and there do seem to be a lot of commonalities in the way uh, people live their lives and were treated. Uh, but I don't really have lots of experience well, of American research, unfortunately, um, other than where people from Britain have gone abroad um, for whatever reason. Um, mm -hmm. It would be very nice if I had the time to dip into yes. it. <laughs> I mean, I think there's definitely there's elements of, of your presentation that like research elements that can be carried internationally, um, you know, uh, particularly, OK, if you if you think about homosexual men there is a legacy of because of british colonialism of you know anti uh those anti-sodomy laws those um laws yeah. against homosexual men so those would have been present in the states as well so um so in terms of research methodology it is looking at the court records the newspaper statements as well yeah. um another area that i um a, a friend of mine was researching actually presbyterian minute books um, and she mm. uh, from the states as well. I think I forgot where in the states. I think I want to say New Hampshire, that kind of region, New England region. Um, but she said the the one year, like she said, the Presbyterian minute book. She said it was wild. There was a lot happening in this community, and these minute books they detail everything. There was a minister <laughs> having um, affairs with a lot of men in the community, and really? it seemed for a while it was actually accepted until I think there was a bit of a. Um, a, a dispute between one of the men. I don't know exactly all the details of it, but it was he was known to have these relationships. Gosh. Um, and nobody really has any remarks until um, there was a confrontation at some point. But um, definitely, I think a lot of your methodology can be applied, though, you know, internationally. I think, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, if you are looking um, at a, uh, a country or um, a region outside of the one that you're familiar with researching, then I think knowing about the the context of the culture, the legal framework and all that sort of mm -hmm. thing is going to be even more important. Otherwise, you could be either looking in the wrong place or, or making assumptions that, um, you know, about the way people behaved and were treated and the decisions that they could make uh, that are actually mm -hmm. not really on the mark. So, um, you know, context is really, really important in all uh -huh. historical studies. 
Yeah. Oh, sorry, I lost your, my screen for a minute there. Um, <laughs> so Victoria was just actually following up where you completely bypassed her second question was about, um, did ask about divorce records from the 1970s and the 1990s, which I think the divorce records for that period are still with the Crown Court. I don't think they're with the National Archives yet, and they would not have been digitized up until that period. Of oh, so. definitely not. I think um, I've had this question before from uh, family history students, and I think even in the... 50s, uh, the sort of mid 20th century, uh, they're difficult to access. Um, I'm not sure whether it would apply to divorce records because I haven't looked at my notes for a long time, but I think there's probably something like a 20 or 30 year um, restriction on them. That's not to say mm -hmm. that you couldn't access them, but you'd have to have uh, what they considered to be uh, a legitimate or pressing reason to see them. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that would be quite difficult. Um, and I'm not sure if you're talking about the 1970s, um, that's still the era when we had lots of local newspapers. And it's the sort of thing mm -hmm. that would have been almost, if you like, announced in the court notices uh, in the small ads at the back of the paper. So it's possible you might see something in there. And I have noticed on the British newspaper archives, a lot of very modern newspapers there. So I think it might even be worth searching that to look or look at the Find My Past uh, version of it uh, for, um, you know, names and um, just to find out what local newspapers there are. Because even at that point in the 70s, they were still, you know, a bit of a gossip circulator uh, mm -hmm. of the locality. And I can remember, you know, as a teenager in the 70s, um, you know, family members whispering about people who got divorced as though it was some absolutely ghastly thing that was happening because it wasn't as common then. Um, so, you know, it could well have made the papers in, in some format. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think, uh, yeah, I, I, Ellie has actually jumped into the comments there to mention that the recent divorces are with the probate re registry. Um, and of mm -hmm. course, T the National Archives has another guide about divorce records for you to, to check out. So, um, yes, I always say if you can't find them, find my past, do go to the National Archives. They have numerous guides to, to help you uh, with these with these. Um, these research queries as well. Um, and Jill, you made a fair point there. If all else fail, fails, jump into the newspapers. Yeah, absolutely. Or contact the, the county archive because, mm -hmm. you know, no question you ask a county archivist has is new. Um, so they will know the answer straight away. And um, you know, don't go down there. Don't, don't go question them in person. Uh, but uh, an email or a phone call uh, not at lunchtime, um, you know, might well get you the answer that you want and they will know uh, where they currently are being stored and how to access them if they are accessible to you as an individual. Because I know from, you know, things like research and adoption that there are some people who are not closely involved with, uh, you know, particular life and family events who simply are not going to have access to them. Uh, and therefore, you then have to do uh, a little bit of lateral thinking as to find um, mm -hmm. other sources for that information. Definitely. I have to say there's been really, you know, really lovely comments coming through um, people sharing their own stories of their, their family history um, and some of the research they're looking at. Um, from our conversation about name changes, uh, Rosie came through, through to say um, it might be worth looking at what is not said in the newspapers. Mm. Um, she mentions that she's looking for a change of name in the 1970s by deep poll um, from male to female and a short comment in a newspaper for the death of his wife omits his or her name and just adds widower. Uh, the date gave me some idea of when the circumstances changed or so to speak. So mm. um, yeah, those tiny little hints, um, reading between the lines, looking at the, the different language being used is very important. Yeah, For that's a, yeah, history. absolutely. And, and that's a lovely example of what I was saying, that you do have to be intuitive with queer history. I mean, it's hard enough with ordinary family history sometimes, but you have to really, um, uh, as Rosie has done uh, very commendably, uh, really look at the details to try and interpret it um, and work out what was being said um, by its absence, if you like. Absolutely. Um, so that is that's bringing us over to about five o'clock now, uh, UK time. 
um, a bit earlier for our friends that have joined from, from the States. And Joe, I just want to say thank you again uh, very much for, for joining us and being our guest speaker today for uh, helping us celebrate LGBT History Month here. And um, if you are, uh, if you've enjoyed today's presentation, I've also added into the comments there where you can find um, Jill's book, Same Sex Love. So do check it out um, or any of her publications. And um, Jill, I think definitely we'll be chatting again. I'm very much interested in your um, your experience with research and adoption, uh, which we'll not get into now. That's a whole other realm of conversations <laughs> yeah. that will start there. But I'm sure we'll have a flurry of questions um, if we go down that road. So um, thank you again to everybody who joined today, or if you're watching a recording, that is excellent. Um, do send in, continue to send in your questions, comments, um, any kind of feedback or interesting topics you'd like us to cover. Uh, we're always interested to hear from you. And thank you for joining Find My Pass at Home. Jill, thank, thank you, you everybody. Much. Thank you for being here. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you.